Nobody can ever take your integrity away from you. You have to give it away. If you do leadership right, you're going to make money. If you don't do it right, I don't care what else you do, you're not going to make money. Retired Lieutenant Colonel Oakland McCullough is a nationally recognized keynote speaker and the author of Your Leadership Legacy, Becoming the Leader You Were Meant to Be. Both his leadership presentation and his book are based on his four plus decades of leadership experience. I'll say that one more time. Four plus decades of leadership experience with 23 years of that experience being a combat arms officer in the U.S. Army. How incredible is that? Oak highlights principles that will benefit today's leaders and inspire the leaders of tomorrow, this coming generation in any profession and at any level of leadership. Now, we've had a lot of leadership experts on the show, but we haven't had a leadership expert with 40 plus years and 23 years of that being in the armed forces. So I'm so excited to talk with Oak to give you strategies and principles you can use in your own leadership with your team, with your family, with your community, wherever you are in your journey currently. When you take away even one piece of advice from Lieutenant Oak, or maybe we simply made you smile or gave you something that can improve your life. All that we ask is you share this show with just one other person who could use it as well. We are grateful for you being the best part of the Be Better team because you are the reason that we've grown the way that we have over the past two years with nearly 300 episodes, which is fantastic. So without further ado, let's talk to the man of the hour all the way down in Daytona Beach, Florida, Mr. Oak McCola. It's great to have you on the show, my friend. How you doing, Brandon? I'm great, sir. So this is the second broadcast back since we had our baby boy, and he's a month old today, which is really cool. Thank you. Yeah, so I'm a bit rusty getting back into things. It's it's weird like, being away for like a month. 300 shows. I mean, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. A couple years of doing it and personal development and, and everything you speak about with leadership really changed my life when I was 21. And that was the whole prompt for me creating this broadcast two years ago and the way that it's grown, meeting great people like you, people like Dr. Rob Bell, who introduced us. It's allowed me to meet a lot of great people and expand my ideas and really get the message out to the people that need it. We're talking earlier about how our world and our companies and this next generation needs leadership more now than ever. So I'm just excited to dive into these principles with you. Yeah, absolutely. So let me ask you, when you spent over 20 years in the military and you're still an active recruiter for, you said you're an active recruiter for the Army currently, correct? Right. I'm a Department of the Army civilian recruiting for Army ROTC. Well, first of all, thank you for your, your extensive service. Thank you. And my question is, what can you only learn about leadership from spending two decades in the military, because we have a lot of leadership experts who come on who are fantastic, who rose up in the corporate world and they learn leadership from that. What is something that maybe you believe you can only learn from spending two decades in the military when it comes to leadership, at least from your experience? Yeah. So I, I'm a firm believer that leadership is leadership. Um, doesn't matter where you learn. It doesn't matter where you practice it. It, those principles are, transferable to whatever profession you decide to do, use them in next. And, and I kind of proved that. I did 23 years in the Army as a combat arms officer, fought our nation's wars. Um, and then when I retired, I ran a food bank for two years. You don't get any different than that. That's 180 degrees difference. Um, and I used the same principles, had had to communicate them a little differently than, than, uh, than I did with soldiers. But the principles are the same. The, the one thing that I think is very military centric, at least for me, was the, the self-discipline piece of it. Um, hmm. You know, you had to be, you always had to set the example. You always had to be on time in the right uniform, in the right place, prepared to do what you had to do. And I think that was one of the things that the military certainly, I was always fairly self-disciplined, played sports. And so I understood those things but certainly doubled down in the military um, the, the importance of being where you're supposed to be and doing the things you're supposed to do, even if nobody else is going to check up on it. They, they are going to check up on it. And they are watching because they always are, but that's not why you do it. You do it for the right reason. So I think that's the one thing that I took out of the military 
was it even made me more self-disciplined than I was before. That's great. Yeah. I learned self-discipline from my father. I wasn't in the military, but my dad and my my mother worked all throughout my upbringing. He was a construction worker and he still is. And my mom was a daycare provider and a waitress and they always showed up on time. They did what they had to do to provide. They, and, and now my father has a successful construction business. So I learned it by watching, but I know there's a lot of people who might not have the luxury of having a set of parents that they can learn from or a role model that they can learn from, maybe even a teenager who's watching the show right now. When it comes to self-discipline, if we can dive into that just for a second. So you mentioned a couple different things. You mentioned showing up on time. You mentioned dressing to the T, right? Being well-dressed, being well put together. How else would you describe self-discipline and how can one build their self-discipline without going to boot camp or joining the military? Yeah, I, and, and you can, and I think it's so important. And, and there is a huge difference between discipline and self-discipline. Discipline is somebody standing over you, telling you what to do, when to do it, how to do it. And, and we need those that as well sometimes. I mean, I got that, and I've had to do that to some people, not many, but few. Um, self-discipline is you deciding what you, that you have to do the right thing. And my father always used to tell me, growing up. He said, son, discipline yourself so other people don't have to. Wow. And, and so it, it, it really does boil down to this. And, and I, I tell people that self-discipline is so important because in the real world, we're not motivated every day. We wish we were, and it'd be great if we were, but unfortunately that's not the real world. There's going to be days when you're not motivated to do the things that you're supposed to do and that you need to do. That's where the self-discipline comes in. If you're not motivated that day, the self-discipline that you have developed for yourself will make you do the things that you should have done and you would have done if you were motivated. So I think some ways to do that is you you have to do it very consciously. You have to decide that you're going to do the things that you need to do on a daily basis. And I'm a firm believer in routines inside of routines. And that's what helps you develop those habits that develop the self-discipline, because we're all creatures of habit. Anybody who tells you they're not a, they're not a creature of habit is lying to you. I, I can't <laughs> tell you. And, you know, if, if you don't believe me, remember how you put your shoes on today, because I promise you, you'll put your shoes on exactly the same way tomorrow. Wow. If you shave, I guarantee you, you shave the exact same way. We are creatures of habit, and that's okay. But you've got to decide that you're going to have good habits that give you good results, And that's how you start the self-discipline piece is you develop habits that make you do the right things on a daily basis every time. Again, whether somebody's going to ever see it, know about it, check up on it, doesn't matter. If you're self-disciplined, you're going to do the right thing. Wow. Yes. I, there was times in my life where talking about punctuality and being on time where there were chains of time that I would be late for work. And this is like my early twenties and it gets, there's the habit goes both ways. The habit goes, you can always be on time or you can always be late. And I will say, it's not easy to break that. It's not easy to break the pattern. You And you have to really ask yourself, what is my routine currently that is causing me not to be on time or if it's the gym, which it was for me at a certain point, what is the current routine I have set that's causing me not to go to the gym? And the answer was my clothes weren't laid out for me. I'm not giving myself the extra 45 minutes to wake up in the morning to get myself ready and go there. So I have the time. So it goes both ways that the habit of, of discipline. Absolutely. It does. You know, Vince Lombardi had a great quote, you know, the winning is an all, all the time thing. It's not a sometime thing. And, and at the end, he said, and winning is a habit. Unfortunately, like you say, so is losing. You know, <laughs> so if you, you, you have a habit that isn't a good habit for you, then you have to make that conscious decision that you are going to change it. And then you got to go about doing that. Um, and, and you're right. It's not easy sometimes, but, but you have to do it. You know, simple things. And, and, and go back to simple things. You know, make your bed every morning. First thing you do when you get out of bed, you make your bed. Um, I do that if I'm in a hotel so on a speaking engagement. Really? Right the morning, I make my bed. That's the first thing I do every single morning. Again, I'm a believer in routines of routines. I start my morning the same way every morning when I can. I mean, obviously, there's times when you can't. But when I can, I get up, 
I light my candle. I sit in my chair. I listen to the daily mass. I read a chapter of the Bible and I say my prayers. I start every day that way. And I end every day exactly the same. I read 10 pages of whatever book I'm reading at that point. I write in my journal because I'm a huge believer in keeping a journal. And then I reflect on that day's activities, whatever I did that day, what did I do well? What did I didn't do so well? Even the things I did well, how could I do better? I think reflection is huge in building your, your success. I think it's huge in building those, those uh, uh, methods to get better at whatever it is you're doing. Because I don't care how good you do something, you could always do it a little bit better probably. Um, so I think routines and root inside of routines is what helps develop your habits, which then develops your self-discipline. That idea of making your hotel bed after you stay in a hotel, I've never heard anyone say that before. I've heard <laughs> make your bed and I do make my bed every single morning yeah. and I feel pride whenever I make my bed because it's like, okay, cool. I did something. And even if yeah, I didn't do something the rest of the success. day, exactly. And I stay in a lot of hotels and I have never made my hotel bed. But now I think about it and I ask myself the question, what's the difference in making my hotel bed than my own bed. I still stayed yeah. in that bed. I took ownership of that bed for the time that I was in that bed. Yeah. So that tells me something about me in those moments. And I just wonder how things could be different if and when I start making my bed at hotels. I love that. That's very cool. Yeah. So again, I, I like it. you know, it, it's, it's a habit for me and it's, it's that yeah. routine inside of the routine. So I, I try to keep everything as much as possible when you can make them a routine inside of a routine and that develops that self-discipline in you. Yeah. 100%. When did uh, journaling become important for you? And when you're journaling, what do you like to reflect on? Yeah. So I, I've kept a journal and pe people don't believe me when I say this, but I, since I, since about the fifth grade, I've kept a journal wow. and, you know, I, I look back on those and you laugh at some of the things you put in there especially at a young age, but, but I've kept, I've kept a journal just about every day of my life for all those years. And, um, and, you know, I, I actually keep two different journals. I keep my personal journal that, you know, my wife says nobody will ever want to read because it's boring. Uh, you know, and I, and I, keep, and I keep things like when I get up, when I go to bed, um, anything, any big event that happened that day, um, then I keep a leadership journal and that came about, I was, I had the privilege of listening to Lieutenant General Hal Moore. And I don't know if it, most people may not know who he is, but he is the guy we were soldiers once and young. That movie was made after that Vietnam battle mm -hmm. and Mel Gibson played him in the movie. Um, and I got, I got an opportunity not only to listen to him once, I got an opportunity to listen to him twice and um, and the first time I was sitting there going to listen to him, I'm sitting in the front row of this auditorium waiting for him to walk out. My boss walks by me and says, oh, what are you doing? And I said, well, sir, I'm waiting to listen to General Moore. And he said, and you don't have a notebook to write <laughs> something down? He said, the, probably one of the greatest combat generals this country's ever produced is getting ready to talk to you. And you don't think you need to write anything down? Shame on you. And he walked away. Never happened again. I don't care if I go. Like, two weeks ago, I was at, at a fiduciary association conference. I was the keynote speaker. I spoke first, but I sat through a bunch of other breakout sessions and 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 uh, presentations. I love doing that. I have a I have a notebook that I'm writing down stuff because I don't care how long you've been doing this. You can always learn something. Mm. And I write down key things, and then I go back and I put that in my leadership journal. I put quotes that I like that I see or hear that I like that I, I put that in my leadership journal. I put decisions that I've made and then how those worked out. Was it a good decision? How could I have done a better job? And I actually go back every once in a while, every time I change jobs throughout my career, I would go back in and I'd look at some key things that I thought would help me in my new job. So I think it's important to, to keep a journal um, and and reflect on, I, I tell people reflect on your daily events, but certainly reflect back on any major events that you have. 
if you, if you if you're the one planning a conference, how did it go? What decisions did you make? How could you have done it better? Um, and and then put those things that you reflected on into use in your next decision that you make and your next uh, project that you're in charge of. It's amazing. I will say I've gotten out of the habit of journaling and I did it for a long time starting in about 2016. I journaled every single day and I haven't made a journal entry in probably the last, well, you know, I write down notes and stuff for my shows and stuff like that. And I take notes for presentations, but for the personal side of things, I haven't made an entry. So this inspires me to begin that again. I'm curious who inspired you in the fifth grade to keep a journal uh, or did this idea just pop into your head that this is. No, it it was Mrs. Zerbrug. She was my fifth grade teacher. I still remember her like, like it was yesterday. And she had everybody in the class do it. And some people just did it during the class and I'm sure they never did it again, but I actually enjoyed it. And so I kept doing it. Um, And she's also the one who, you know, I was always the class clown. I was getting in trouble. You know, I (laughs) get called, my parents would get calls and they say, you you know what Oak just did? And they were never surprised. I mean, I I was, (laughs) but, but at one point I remember this, like it was yesterday. She called me, kept me after school. She said, Oak, she, everybody was leaving. She said, hold on just one minute. She called me up to her desk and she said, look, look, young man, you have to make a decision here. Are you going to continue to be the class clown and somebody who's always causing trouble? Or are you going to make something out of yourself? Wow. She said, and you need to make that decision and it needs to be pretty quick. And, and I remember that like it was yesterday and, and it just kind of clicked. And, you know, I, started getting better grades. I started behaving myself in school. I started taking things seriously. And, and she, I give her credit for probably changing the trajectory of my life. I really do. Wow. What a fantastic role model. Did you ever have the chance to, to talk with her after I, your school experience? I, I haven't. I wish I did. Okay. Uh, I do keep in touch with two of my mentors from high school. One wow. was my history professor who I still stay in contact or teacher uh, who I still stay. And the whole reason I majored in history in college was him. Okay. He he gave, he gave us the love, gave me the love of history. Uh, And he was a a good mentor of mine in high school. And then my high school basketball coach, coach Niswicki, um, who I still stay in contact with. And, uh, and he understood that it it wasn't just about making a, a good basketball team. It was about making good young men that were going to be good citizens and productive members of society. And he did yeah. a great job of doing that. Yeah, absolutely. It's great that you've had those, th- those role models. I had one specific role model in high school who was my business teacher and those teachers who make that difference. You remember them for oh, your entire absolutely life. Absolutely. You do. Absolutely. That's very special. Very special. Uh, so I'd like, like to ask you based on what you said a second ago about that teacher pulling you aside and saying you have to make a decision at this point in your life. And it's great that you received that well, especially being in the fifth grade, which made you probably maybe 11, 12 years old. Exactly. And it's great that you received that. It's made a difference for you. I heard a quote once that said something along the lines of, you only change when the pain of being the same is greater than the pain of change. Yeah. And I'd like to ask you, you are someone who is very esteemed. You have an incredible career that you're still adding on to, and you're very growth focused. Even today, you're constantly looking to grow. You're still journaling, all these things. Was there a moment in your adult life, maybe it was when you entered the military, where pain became or change became inevitable for you? You said to yourself, I have to focus on growth if I'm going to make it. And also, you could take this question as when did you realize the value of growing professionally in your career? Yeah, so I think um, that, that's a great question. I don't know that I've ever been asked that question. You know, I've been on, like I told you, this is like the 112th podcast or radio show or webinar. I've never been asked that question. So that's a good one. Um, so I, I think it was probably in high school is when I because I was always, I played baseball, basketball, football in high school, and I was always the captain of the team. And I, I, I was one of the, 
went to a small high school. So I was one of the key players on all the teams. And, and, and I, I finally realized, okay, I, I'm the starting shortstop on the baseball team, but if I want to be the starting shortstop on my college team, then I'm going to have to get better that this, although I'm good enough for this, it, I'm probably not going to be good enough for the next step. Um, and so I, I did, I had, I made changes in the way that I practiced. I made changes in the way that I prepared in the off seasons. You know, I started running, I started working out in the off seasons as well. Um, so I think probably at that point, I started to realize that no matter how good you are at what you do, if you want to get better at it, if you want to move to the next level, you got to make those changes and you got to constantly be looking at yourself to see how to get better. And my, and my father kind of instilled that in me uh, when I was a little kid, you know, played, played little league baseball. And I played baseball from the time I was, I don't know, but little league all the way through college. Wow. And all those years, my father told me I played a good game one time. Really? One time. You know, and all these other parents, I'd see their them telling their kids after a game and they didn't play a good game. And the father would say, oh, great game. Yeah. And my father wouldn't. Every, every single, after every single game, he would say, okay, Oak, okay, here's something you could have done better. Hmm. He, and then he would take me out back. And if it was ground, uh, fielding ground balls to my right, he'd hit me 50, 100 ground balls to my right. If it was to the left, he'd do it to the left. Whatever it was, he would show me that there is a way to get better at it. Wow. Um, and then one day I, I was pitching uh, a game. I pitched a one hitter. I went four for four. I hit a home run and I came off the field and he said, played a pretty good game. Wow. And that, that probably hit different, right? It did. Yeah. And do you agree? Is there anything that you, if let's put you in your father's position at that point where yeah. you're coming off the field and you're about to give feedback to your son and maybe even your grandkids at this point, would you do anything different knowing what you know now, or is that strategy tried and true? So I, I do believe that, that we have to be honest with kids and people that if they played a good game, then you tell them. Now, if they didn't play, if they played a horror game, game, you got to tell them that too. But really? I think the one thing that I have done over the years with my kids, and I hope to do with my grandkids, is I say, I, I, I say, okay, you did well, but there are some things that you can do better. Um, so I think, you know, you got to give them credit where they did some things well. And I, I think that, because my my brothers didn't take that very well the way my father was i can just tell you i had three brothers that they looked at it as criticism from <laughs> completely and 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 i i don't know why i didn't i don't know why i looked at it differently than they did mm -hmm. maybe it's because i wanted to be better because i yeah. wanted to be the best i could be at whatever i did and that was something that my father instilled in me as well and you know growing up he had this thing called the 75% rule and he'd say, son, if you can't do something better than 75% of the people doing it, then you need to do one of two things. You either need to figure out how to get better at it, or you need to go find something else to do, because obviously it doesn't matter to you. Wow. Now, obviously, he didn't expect you to be doing something better than 75% of the people doing it the day you started. But that should be your goal. Every day you want to get a little bit better so that eventually you're doing something in the top 25% of whoever's doing it whatever it is that they're doing. Yeah. Excellent advice. That's the second amazing line your father's given you throughout this. Yeah. He, he was a mean old man, but, but I am who I am today. <laughs> because of him. There's no doubt about it. What did your father do for a living? So he never finished the eighth grade. Uh, he worked in a factory most of his, most of my life and his life. Um, and then uh, near the end of his life, he bought a bar in our small little town of 1200 people. And he ran a bar for a few years uh, until he retired. Uh, but he died at 60, 63. So, I mean, he smoked okay. himself to death. Um, so, unfortunately, he's been gone since 1995. So, yeah. haven't, haven't had him around. But, uh, but he is who I am today. I mean, my mother certainly had influence. And my 
two people in high school I talked about. Other people in my life have had influence. But the initial influence who made me who I am today is my father, no doubt about it. That's right. We can only hope that our children become even greater versions of who we were, but in their own special way. Like and you- that was his goal. I mean, he, he, you know, I, I can remember as a young man, he, he, he looked at me and said, son, you are going to college. I'm not paying for it, but, but you're going <laughs> to college, so figure it out. And, you know, I remember that as a kid. And, and I, that, was my, that was the expectation, that I was going to go to college and I was going to get a degree. And, you know, he wanted me to be better than him. He wanted me to have opportunities that he may have had at some point, but probably didn't growing up when he grew up and where he grew up. He, that was probably never even an option to him. But he wanted me to have those options. So he he started when I was young, putting expectations on me that uh, that he expected me to meet. Yes, it sounds like he did the best with the resources that he had. He did, and he left quite the mark on you. And now you're out there making yeah. quite the and, mark on a lot and of I people. Can, and I can tell you, I mean, I've I, I say I am who I am. I also learned a lot of things that I didn't want to do. <laughs> well, because he he. He wasn't perfect by any stretch. And there was times he did things um, that I said, yeah, I'm never going to do that. And and that's OK. I tell people all the time, look, you can learn things. You can learn just as many things from somebody who's doing it wrong than you can from somebody who's doing it right. You just got to remember that and say, look, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do it that way. Um, and I've, d- I've done that throughout my career. You know, I'd be standing in formation and some some boss would stand up and say something and the hair on the back of your neck stands up and you're like, what? I will never do that. You know? Yeah. And, and that's okay. That That's a, that's a lesson and lessons come in both ways from good, good events and from bad events. Absolutely. hundred percent. So I'd like to ask you your book you released in 2021. And for those listening, the title of Oak's book is your leadership legacy, becoming the leader that you were meant to be. And there's going to be links in the description to go check out this book for everyone listening. By the way, do you have a copy of the book next to you somewhere by chance? I do. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's see the cover of that book and a little teaser that we'll talk about at the, the conclusion of this episode. He's working on a new book in the future here. Okay, great. Oh, look at you. That's yeah. great. When was that picture taken? Uh, 2013, 14. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Looking very official. <laughs> when, you, when you wrote this book, what was your, intention what what was your why behind writing this book yeah so i that, that i get asked that a lot and and to be honest when i wrote it i expected that i was writing it for young aspiring or brand new leaders um and i think i did that if you read the reviews on amazon and i talked to people who have read it uh especially young men and women absolutely but one of the things i found out over the year, couple years that it's been out, I get messages from people who have been leaders for 20, 30 years who tell me that they got something out of it. I, I had a two-star Marine Corps general who read it, didn't know him. He read it, sent me a message on LinkedIn um, and said, you know, Oak, I didn't learn a whole lot of new things in your book. I, I learned a few new techniques of how to do some things. He said, but this is what I took out of it. As I was reading along, I saw something and I said to myself, you know, I used to do that really well and I don't do that so well anymore. Maybe I need to go back and put some time into doing that better because, wow. you know, I don't care how long you've been a leader. You know, you, there, you can always use those reminders or the, those nudges to get you back to doing whatever it is that you used to do that made you successful. And I had I had one senior NCO. He'd been a, a I think he was a master sergeant, maybe he was a sergeant major uh, in the army and retired. And he and he wrote a review on Amazon and said, you know, I wish somebody would have given me this book 25 years ago when I was just starting out. A lot of lessons in here that I wouldn't have had to learn the hard way. I could have learned them from this. So so I think again, I think leadership is leadership. And I think that the principles are the same, no matter what level of leadership you go to. I think we just have to have a, we, 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 every once in a while, we need a nudge to get back to doing the things that we know we should be doing that help make us successful. And I think this book 
can help you do that. If, if you're a seasoned leader, if you're a junior leader, just starting out, give you some advice that maybe you can prevent you from making some dumb, dumb decisions. Yeah, absolutely. Do you remember that the Marine who reached out to you and wrote that they, they learned a couple of things, but they've remembered more so something they used to do. Do you remember what that thing that they used to do was that they no, he, he never told doing? me that? Oh, okay. Got it. No, he, he didn't say that. He just, he just told me he, there were a couple things in there that he, re, that, that reminded him that he needs to get back and doing those things. Absolutely. Do you believe that there is a defining law or principle of leadership where if this one doesn't exist, it makes all the subsequent ones very difficult or yep. impossible to achieve. Yes. Integrity beyond a doubt. Uh, you got, you have to be a, a person of your word. You have to do the things that you say you're going to do. You know, again, go back to my father. My father used to tell me as a, as a young boy, he'd say, son, if you say one thing, and you do another, it is your actions that will be believed, not what you said. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, and he, and he, then he ended that, ended that piece of advice with this. He said, nobody can ever take your integrity away from you. You have to give it away. Wow. Um, and he said, and it's the most important thing you have in your life. Um, and I believe that, you know, because leadership is about trust because it's about people. Plain and simple. Leadership is about people. It's not about flow charts or organizational charts. It's not about the bottom line. I got it. We got to make money. If you're a business owner, I got that. But that's not. If you do leadership right, you're going to make money. If you don't do it right, I don't care what else you do. You're not going to make money because it's about people and people have to trust you. And nobody is going to trust you if you don't have integrity and without trust. You know, again, go back to Vince Lombardi quote. Um, a team is not a group of people who play together. A team is a group of people, people who trust each other. And I believe that. And, you know, that is integrity is the underlining part of the trust. Do you believe integrity is, and you kind of already said this, but I'm curious to see where else you take it. Do you believe integrity? Cause this is a big, it's a big word. It right? is. It's like a philosophy and it's, it's the state of being. Do you believe that you either have integrity or do you believe integrity comes from your actions? And let me, let me preface this and, and say it this way. Someone who had a lapse of integrity, maybe they were this esteemed leader and they made a decision that, and they're still a good person, but they made a decision that showed a lapse in their integrity. Do you believe that this is a person who lacks integrity or do you believe this is a an integral person who made a bad decision. No, we all make bad decisions. Look, there are no perfect people in this world. I, I keep trying to convince my wife I am. She's not buying it. You know, you, <laughs> would, think, you would think after 36 years I could get her to believe me, but no. We're, we're all going to make bad decisions. We're all going to make mistakes. Here's the difference. If you want to maintain that trust and you want to maintain that your integrity with the people who work for you and around you and know you, then you got to be upfront and honest and say, Hey, look, I made a mistake and this is how we're going to fix it. it. Where you lose the integrity and you lose the trust is when you then try to hide it or you blame somebody else or something like that. If you are upfront and honest and say, look, I made a mistake, then people are willing to forgive you. Now, there's a difference between making a mistake and doing something that you know is absolutely wrong. A yes. huge difference there. But if you made, made an honest mistake or you made a bad decision, and we all do, I don't care who you are, um, then just be honest about it. And as long as you do that, then I think you're okay. That's powerful. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. So your book, the second, the subtitle of it is Becoming the Leader That You Were Meant to Be. By that, I'm assuming that what you are proposing is that there are different types of leaders. Absolutely, there are. How, how does one d determine the type of leader that they are? Are there many different kinds? What, what are your thoughts there? So, so I had a boss who retired a, a four-star general, um, so obviously way smarter than me. Um, and he told me one day, he said, Oak, leadership is on a scale. And he said, on this scale, end of the scale, you've got that authoritarian, 
micromanaging, do everything exactly as I tell you to do type of person that nobody wants to work for. And I've worked for that person. And that's horrible. He said, and then on this end of the scale, you have Attila the Hun and chaos. And he said, and you want to be as close to chaos, as far close to Attila the Hun as you can get. Really? He said, and this is why. He said, because that's where creativity happens. That's where you use other people's abilities, other people's skills, other people's knowledge. He said, on the other end, the micromanaging authoritarian, you're only using your skills, your knowledge, your abilities, and you're cheating that organization out of all the other talent in there. So I'm a firm believer in servant leadership, um, that it isn't about you. It's about the people you have the privilege, and it is a privilege to lead, and the organization that you have the privilege to lead. And I tell all these young lieutenants that we commission out of our program, I go up to every one of them on commissioning day. And this year we commissioned 63 of them. And I, I walk up to every one of them and I say, look, celebrate today because today is all about you. You get to do something that very few people in this country get to do anymore. And that's become an officer in the United States Army. Yeah. I said, so celebrate, have fun. I said, but just remember this. Tomorrow morning when you wake up, since we've already pinned those bars on your shoulder, it will never be about you ever again. It is about the people you have the privilege to serve. It's about the organization you are serving, the mission you have to accomplish. It's about the army. It's about the country. And then if we have time, we might talk about you, maybe. Because hmm. uh, it isn't about you as a leader, or at least in my opinion, it shouldn't be. It's not about the title you get or the privileges you get or that you get better pay and live in a nicer house and drive a nicer car. Let's face it, leaders get those things every once in a while. But if that's the only reason you want to be the leader, go do something else. Yeah. You're not going to be a good one. So I think, you know, I, I'm not a theory guy. I, I know theory. I've studied leadership theory and all that. But I don't talk about theory. I don't in my book or in my presentation. I don't even mention theory because I, I don't th think it matters. I can teach you all the theory in the world and that's not going to make you a good leader. Yeah. But I think. The, the best leaders I've had in my career are servant leaders who understood that it wasn't about them. It was about that next generation of leaders that they're going to produce. And to me, that's your legacy. You know, somebody asked me about, said, you know, you're pretty egotistical if you're talking about your leadership legacy. And I said, then obviously you haven't read my book and you haven't heard me talk. <laughs> it's not about me. I mean, let's face it. In the real world, results matter and leaders need to get results. But that's a small part of your legacy small part. The big part, in my opinion, is that next generation of leaders that you produce, who then produce the next generation of leaders, who then produce the next generation of leaders. And somebody who worked for me, and I say he worked for me, he was probably a better leader than I was, Master Sergeant David Powell, when I was running my ROTC program, he worked for me. And one day we were talking about the importance of what we were doing producing that next generation of leaders, not only for the army, but for the nation. And he said to me, he said, you know, sir, great leadership handed down from generation to generation is what develops great nations. And I thought, wow, what a powerful quote. And the most powerful part of that quote is that you can take that word nations and you can substitute anything you want for that company, organization, food bank, hospital, university, sports team, doesn't matter. It doesn't change the power of that, that quote. That's right. You're, you're a quote machine. I love the, the wise quotes I'm hearing from you. And I'm, I haven't heard them before, which is why I respect them even more. I hear a lot of the same quotes a lot. And yeah. you're, you're giving me a lot of different ones, many that you've heard from your father and, and your colleagues. Let's talk to the new officer in the military. Let's talk to the new team leader in an organization who have high hopes for being the best leader that they can possibly Absolutely. be. They want to be as close to that chaotic Attila the Hun part of the scale as they possibly can. And now they're asking the practical question of where do I begin in being the best servant leader that I can be? Where, where does one begin? Okay. Uh, the biggest piece of advice I give young men and women is – Get to know the people you have the privilege to lead. Now, I got it. You got to keep that leader-led relationship. But that doesn't mean that you can't get to know the people who you have that privilege to lead. 
And I tell people a couple ways to do that. Number one, do not lead from behind your desk. Nobody wants to follow a leader who is leading behind his desk. Now, I got it. Leaders got, do have to spend time behind their desk, filling out forms and doing all those things. I got it. But every chance you get, you ought to get out of your office and go down and be with the people that you have the privilege to lead and get to know them. I tell young leaders every day, this should be your goal. Every day you go out and find one person in your organization and you find out one new thing about that person, not about work, about their personal life. What's their spouse's name? What's their kid's name? What sports do their kids play? What hobbies do they have? What do they like? What do they don't like? Because you're going to assign people tasks to get accomplished. If you don't know that person, you might give them a task that they're not going to be good at. Um, The more you know that person, the better that relationship, work relationship is going to be. So go find one person, find out one new thing. And a good way to do that, one, there's a couple of good ways to do that. One, get out, out out, out of your office and go down and talk to people where they work, not in your office. Because if you ask somebody a question in your office, you are going to get a completely different answer than if you go down where they're working and ask them that same question. Because yeah. if, if you do it in your office, it's like going to the principal's office. They're, they think they're <laughs> in trouble. So go, get out and talk to them there. And a good way to do that, I had a boss who retired a three-star general. And he told me one day, he said, Oak, I don't care high, how high up in your organization you get, never, ever, ever turn down a chance to go get your own cup of coffee. He said, two things happen when you do that. Number one, you show everybody in your organization that you're no better than they are. you got to go get your own cup of coffee just like they do. And number two, if you're lucky, you got two or three different ways to get to the coffee machine and back to your office. And along the way, you stop and talk to people. Wow. People. Get to know people. It's about people. Plain yes. and simple. It's about people. I love that. Find one person, learn one new thing for the companies. And there are many now who are working in a very virtual way where their team is one person's in Florida, one's in Illinois, one's in in Texas. How does one do that in that fashion? Does that just mean hop on a, a Zoom call? and have a personal conversation or how would you recommend it to that person? Yeah. I've, and I've, I've, people have asked me that question, you know, not only about this, but about just how do I run, run my meetings? How do I said, you know, you're probably going to have to run a couple more meetings than you normally would have. And a couple of things about that is number one, everybody must have their camera on, mm. have somebody on a meeting and have their, their camera is, on. how do you know what they're doing? That they're exactly. even there, that they're paying attention. Everybody has their camera on. I said, and then every opportunity that you get, and it may only be once a year, maybe once a quarter, whatever it is, you bring those people together. And it's worth the cost, you know, because I get people say, well, you know how expensive that's going to be? How expensive it is, is it if you don't build that team? If, because building that team, they have to like go back to Vince Lombardi. They got to trust each other. If they don't know each other, how are they going to trust each other? Because the trust goes three different ways. Trust is from the leader to the lead, from the lead to the leader, and then everybody on that team. They have to trust each other. So if you don't build that trust, then how expensive is that going to be for your organization? So at least once a year, I got it. Money's important. At least once a year, make that effort to bring as many people as you can together. But then you might have to have, instead of once once a quarter, maybe once every two weeks or once a week, you have a Zoom meeting to talk about business, but also just to maybe open it up by every meeting, one, you pick one person, say, tell tell us a little bit about yourself. Just so that people understand that there are other people out there. I'll I'll, I'll give you a very simple example. Even in a building, I had an acquaintance here in the area and he owns a business and he was he, he realized that people in his organization didn't even know each other. Mm-hmm. And so what he said was every Friday, it is a no text, no email, no phone call Friday inside the building. He said, no, I got it. If, you, if you're talking to somebody outside the organization, send them email, send them text, call them. Got you have to. But if it's inside this building, 
no text, no email, no phone calls. If you got to talk to somebody, get out of your chair, go find them and talk to them in person. Yeah. He said the, the result was unbelievable. People started to get to know each other. They started to trust each other. They started to communicate like humans face to face instead of texting. He said it was amazing the result that he got out of that. Yes. Wise words. One of the most beautiful points of my leadership career for a company that I worked with was during the pandemic. It was in 2020 where all of our new hire training went virtual. So every month we had 20 people or so in each class and it was on Zoom. And we practiced a lot of the principles of, you know, have your camera on, you know, have people share something about themselves so it can get personal. And one of the greatest things that happened was even at the very beginning, we had a group chat with everyone and people used it. They talked. We had fun in there. Something magical happened when six months to a year after the training, we started to bring each of the classes in to one area together. We did a two-day reunion, a new hire reunion, we called it, where we brought everyone in. Awesome and we had, Yeah, and we brought, in like a, we brought in like a hypnotist and we brought in like a deal or no deal kind of type of game show. And we had some content and training and stuff mixed in as well. But we brought everyone to dinner. They had roommates in the hotel we were staying at. There was no greater way to boost performance than to bring everybody together so that like what you said, they can get to know each other. And there's no better way to get a group chat to go from zero to 10 out of 10 than to bring everyone together so people can get to know each other. Absolutely. Because there's just something primal. Like the first thing that you mentioned is I love how we can meet people from all over the place with, with StreamYard or Zoom the way that we have. But I have loved even more the people that I've gotten to meet, like the hosts that 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 I was able to meet up with and have dinner with, like in San Francisco and the other places you travel. And that's the very first thing you said, because as human beings, it's a very primal thing to get together face to face. Like what we're doing right now is beautiful because we're reaching people who might never have known you, never might have seen your your wisdom or your experience. But this is not the same as it being isn't face to face, but it's better than nothing, but it's not the same. And it has its benefits. But like what you said before we recorded, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, but it's, it's, it's a primal thing to get to know people and be there with them to share physical space with them. Because we, again, it's all about people and, and the people that work in your organization have to understand that they're not alone, that it is a part of a team. Even if they're working in remote places, never, and never, ever sit or in the same office ever working, that's okay. If, if that works for your company and that's the way it, it's designed, good. But you still got to bring them together to make them understand that they're still part of a team and that, that they're, not, they're not an individual out there just on their own. And the only way to, to do that is for them to get to know each other. That's right. Oak, I've had a great time chatting with you. And we, we talked about your book, which is your leadership legacy, becoming the leader that you were meant to be. For everyone listening, go grab your copy on Amazon. The link is in the description to grab your copy. I've also included a link to Oak's website so you can check out his website and his LinkedIn so that you can connect with him. And the, the, Oak's the real deal. His book's got hundreds of five-star reviews on Amazon. And I don't say that to blow you up, but I have a lot of people on the show who, who aren't there, right? And that only says one thing. People are buying your book. People are loving your book. And it's helping a lot of people, even Marines, even top level executives in many different industries. You're a, a speaker and a facilitator traveling around, speaking to many diverse groups of leaders from many different industries. And would you be comfortable sharing the next project you're working on and maybe even the next book that you, you have an idea yeah. for creating right now? Yeah. So I, I retire from my day job here on one October, uh, so not that I'm counting, but like 128 days. Uh, then, <laughs> <laughs> my next speaking engagement is in July and it's in New York City. I'm going to talk to a bunch of CEOs and presidents of construction companies that really specialize in healthcare facilities. Um, and then, uh, then I've got one in October in London where I'm going to talk to a bunch of CEOs and presidents of companies. Um, but Starting one October, the day I retire, I'm going to start my second book. I give a second presentation about how to be successful, where I talk about how to set goals and accomplish goals. I talk about self-discipline. I talk about habits. I talk about all those things that, look, there, somebody said, well, what's the secret to success? There are no secrets to success, okay? There's no cookie cutter thing. I can't tell you 
do these things and you're going to be successful. I'm sorry, that's not the real world. I can tell you things that will help you, that will increase your opportunity to be successful. And that's what the book is going to, that's what my presentation covers. And that's what the book is going to cover uh, going forward. And then I'm just going to concentrate on getting out and doing speaking engagements to as many people as I can. Because really at this point in my life, that is my passion to help develop even more. So help that next gener generation of leaders, because that is our responsibility as current leaders. Absolutely. I know we've got a part two in the future. And I'll tell you, even if that book only contained an extended version and dialogue of what you've mentioned about self-discipline and what you've mentioned about reflection and journaling and your story there and how you began journaling and those, those different facets, if it only contained that, then you have another incredible book that will spark even more incredible conversations. So for everyone listening, go follow Oak in the description, go grab a copy of his book. Lieutenant Colonel, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Thanks for making the time. And it's great to meet you. Oh, absolutely, Brandon. Thanks for having me on the show. And I'd love to do another show with you sometime in the future. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Whether you are in the military, whether you are in a company and organization, or whether you plan to use these principles and strategies for your family and for your children, for your, for your spouse, or even for your community then you took something from this conversation, I hope, that you can take and use immediately, whether it's people are everything, whether it's integrity, whether it's the self-discipline or the reflection talk that we, that we mentioned. We talked about a lot of different things that you can take and use in your business or your life. And I know I took something out of this conversation personally, and I hope that you did too. If you took even one thing away from this conversation with Lieutenant Colonel Oakland Mikola, then please share this show with just one other person who could use it as well. Again, you are the best part of the Be Better team and the Be Better family, and we are grateful for you. Be sure to go in the description and follow Lieutenant Colonel Oak, as well as grab a copy of his book so that you are also in the know of his next book and how the progress on that is going. Thank you so much for watching and listening to the Be Better broadcast. And until we speak again next time, continue to be better.